We're turning this morning to the first scripture passage that we read in Genesis chapter 22. And I'll read verse 14. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 14. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. There are two veins in the mine of scripture at this chapter I'd like us to consider this morning. There is a practical vein. We learn much from the example of Abraham when his faith was tested. He passed that test gloriously and confirmed his confidence in God. But there is also a prophetic vein and significance to the truth of the events of this chapter. They are, in a sense, a prophecy in action. So much here is typological. Isaac is a type of Christ. Abraham, a type of the Father. And what a display is here of Calvary itself. Well, this was the ultimate test of Abraham's faith. It may have seemed that Isaac, finally born, grown up to a young man, Abraham's trials were at an end. But no, we read at the beginning of this chapter, after these things, God did tempt or test Abraham. God rarely leaves his people long without a trial. Faith is not perfect unless it is a working faith, a faith that has been exercised, proved and approved by the trials of God upon us. James chapter 22, chapter 2 verse 22 tells us that by this trial and the actions of Abraham associated with it, his faith was made perfect. Perfect in the sense it was complete because it was no longer a faith in principle, a faith in word and confession, but a word that is made perfect by the actions that confirmed it. Abraham, by his obedience and submission to the command of God, shows that he has complete confidence in what God has spoken. And that is what God delights to see in all his children. He likes to see in us, not only that we say that we trust him, but by our lives we show that we trust him. And that's why the Lord appoints trials for his people. Imagine if you are placed in Ukraine as a believer at the moment. It's a great trial to those Christian people there. Will they trust the Lord? when they see the missiles flying overhead? Well, they stand firm in their joy and their confidence and their labor for the Lord when they are exposed to fearsome things. Who knows how we would fare in such a trial? Now, reference is made sometimes to four great crises in the life of Abraham, four trials in each case, he displays his faith in God. But this was the ultimate trial. First, there was that trial where he is called to leave kith and kindred in Ur of the Chaldees. It would have been a wrench. Archaeology has confirmed that Ur of the Chaldees at that time was a sophisticated, technologically advanced civilization. And yet he is called to leave it, to go into an unknown land. His faith was put to the test. It was a great crisis, but he obeyed, says Hebrews chapter 11. Then there was that trial at the time when he and Lot's herdmen fell out with one another 
and he was happy to leave the issue with the Lord. Lot chose the best pastures. He was content that he had his God. A trial of faith. He had to lose Lot in order to remain obedient to his God. Then there was the trial with Ishmael. It was no easy matter for Abraham to obey the Lord and send Ishmael with his mother Hagar away from the, the household. In obedience to God, he does so. But here was the greatest trial of all. This command of the Lord to take Isaac, whom he loved, and go into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains. Faith is made perfect when we are submissive and trusting of the Lord's appointments. But this was the greatest trial of all to Abraham. And I'm sure when we think of the narrative here, if we put ourselves in Abraham's shoes, we would say, how did he manage to trust God and submit to the Lord in such circumstances? He had to submit all his emotions to faith. All his emotions would have said, this cannot be. Verse 2 reminds us that he loved Isaac dearly. But then there was the emotional turmoil of what will Sarah think? It's likely he never told Sarah. But if he assumed the worst, then how would he tell Sarah? He had to submit all his powers of reason, all his strongest, strongest earthly affections to the conviction of faith. God has commanded, and yet God has promised, and therefore God will secure a favorable outcome. That's what he believed. But reason couldn't trace the, the, the way in which God would both keep his promise that Abraham, that Isaac, sorry, would be the one son in whom all the promises of God would be fulfilled. And yet at the same time, he was called to sacrifice him at Moriah. Well, the final outcome shows that God did not desire, desire the death of Isaac, but he desired Abraham's complete surrender and willingness to offer him to God. No other way could that test fully be, uh, 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 no other test could fully expose Abraham's complete surrender and trust in God. He had to cause Abraham to bring his reason into complete captivity to faith. The most remarkable trial of faith recorded in the whole of scripture. It was against his affections. It was real, realistically against the moral revelation of God who had declared after the flood, he who sheds man's blood, I will require it of his hand. How could Abraham lay straight in his mind that moral revelation which he knew with this command which he believed had come from the Almighty? There was no doubt in his mind that it was God who had given this instruction. It could potentially send Sarah to an early grave. It would potentially ruin his testimony as a man of God amongst the Canaanites. It seemed to be against all the promises of God, which he had been assured rested upon Isaac. And yet even though Abraham could not fathom and lay straight in his powers of reason these commands, he had to believe 
and trust in God. He's an example to us, friends. There are many times when in life, reason says, I cannot see how this is good for me. I cannot see how God is in control of my situation. I cannot see how this is right. Satan will whisper in our ear, God is cruel. God is unkind. Be assured, that same thought was whispered in Abraham's ear. I'm sure it was. But Abraham, our great father in the faith, says we trust God. Job was similar. Remember how Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. We trust God. Whatever outward appearances seem to suggest to the contrary. Look at the evidence then in this chapter of the triumph of Abraham's faith. Firstly, in verse 3, we read of Abraham's prompt obedience, rising up early in the morning, saddling his ass. That suggests he was now elderly. The young men could walk. He would carry and he carries with him the wood, the fire, the knife, and the lamb. Isaac, his own son. It would have been a painful journey, three days, in the heat of the land, and yet he perseveres. Reason couldn't fathom the command here is the son of promise. God required him to sacrifice that very son. But faith rises to the insurmountable problem. Look here at what is said in verse 5 by Abraham to his young men. That was an act of faith in and of itself. He left the young men here. Perhaps they would have restrained him from the act of sacrifice. He leaves them behind. But notice what he says here. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. We will come again. That's the language here. We are going to worship. We are coming again. And Hebrews chapter 11, we must turn to this because it gives to us an insight into the faith of Abraham at this point. We're told by faith, Abraham, this is verse 17, chapter 11 of Hebrews. Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Here is an insight into Abraham's faith at this point. How can he speak to his young men and say, we're coming again? He believed. But because Abraham and because Isaac was the son of, in whom all the promises were vested, then if he will have me kill him, he's able to bring him back to life. This is Abraham's triumph of faith. Some may look at verse 5 and say, Abraham, how could you call this transaction you were called to make an act of worship, to take your son to lay him upon the altar, is that worship? Notice he says here, we will worship. Well, what is worship? Worship has at its very heart complete submission to the Lord. That's what they were doing. In obedience to God, they went to Moriah and the pair of them acted in complete submission to God. Have you come to worship this morning in that spirit? You've come to completely submit your life to God afresh. 
We submit to his author the authority of his word. Whatever he says, we say, I believe it. I submit to its authority. I am ready to obey it. If we haven't come in that spirit, we haven't come with a right spirit of worship. We come in all our circumstances, with all the difficulties of life. Worship is such a liberating exercise because we submit our lives week by week to the Lord. We say, here am I, Lord, with all my circumstances, with all my troubles, with all my uncertainties, but I submit myself to thee afresh. And here are Isaac and Abraham exercising true worship. The word worship here, it means to bow, to bow before the Lord. Have you and I done that this morning? Well, here is an example of complete surrender and submission of himself to God, but not simply Abraham. Isaac here is an example of complete submission to God. We do not know at which point Abraham finally revealed to Isaac that he was the sacrifice. But Isaac, although he is referred to here as a lad, he was a young man. There are many young men amongst us here. If your father took you and laid you upon an altar of wood, you could resist. Remember, Abraham is a hundred years old. Isaac could have easily said, hang on. What are you doing with that knife? But Isaac submits, believing himself that this is the command of God to his father. Submitting to that appointment himself. They are both exemplary in their faith and submission. And so we have to draw this conclusion and this application before we move on from the practical application of this passage. Are we submissive to God? Do we surrender our lives to him as we should? Remember the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. This is worship. I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies, the entirety of your being, that means a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. Are we prepared to sacrifice all that we are, our dearest possessions? Isaac here, uh, uh, Abraham here is called to sacrifice his dearest possession, Isaac, to the Lord. And the Lord honors him later in the chapter and says, Now I know, verse 12, that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Abraham loved his son, but he'd not made an idol of him. The Lord proved that. But sometimes we can make an idol of our dearest possessions. Our children can be idols. We can think more of them and focus our attention more upon them than upon God. But the Lord calls us to surrender our all to him. When God tests Abraham, at first it may have appeared by the language that he was so cruel. But how it drew forth a glorious manifestation of Abraham's faith, as we read in James chapter 2. The scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. And we say, hang on a minute, isn't that chapter 15? Isn't that where God first be, uh, revealed the promises to Abraham? And where G Abraham first, it's recorded that he believed and it was imputed to him for righteousness. James, you've got your chapters wrong. James would answer, no, I haven't. Because chapter 22 is where Abraham believed even more certainly 
and received confirmation even more vividly of those promises which God had made. And so let's think now of this narrative from its prophetic point of view. I'm going to run out of time, I fear, but we must have a focus upon these things. We often think of prophecy in the Old Testament as when a prophet declared, thus saith the Lord. We think of Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and so on. But God also used Abraham as a prophet. He's referred to as a prophet in Psalm 105. But how was Abraham a prophet? Not so much by his word, but by his life. His whole life is, in some respects, a prophecy. We're told in John chapter 8, verse 56, the Lord Jesus Christ said to the Jewish rulers, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and was glad. When did Abraham see the day of Christ? Hmm? What is Christ referring to? The Jews said, you're not 50 years old. How did Abraham see you? Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Well, when was that? When Isaac was born. What was Isaac's name? Laughter. The laughter of joy. That's when Abraham rejoiced, as we thought only a week or two ago. When Abraham named Isaac, he rejoiced because he understood that Isaac was the son of promise. He looked upon Isaac and he thought, God is going to keep his promise of a savior. He's given me a son. And in this son is the token that God will bring about a great salvation. Messiah will come. He saw the day of Christ in the birth of Isaac. But I suggest to you that he saw the day of Christ in his death in this chapter. He understood, perhaps only a glimpse we may say. He wouldn't have grasped the fullness of the significance of this event. But this event taught him something about how the salvation of Christ would be brought about. He would be the great deliverer, but the deliverer himself must suffer. The seed of promise must be the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. It's a profound and yet remarkable event that is before us here. And Abraham saw as a result of it in even greater clarity in the offering of Isaac here, how the blessing promised would be secured. The son of promise sacrificed himself. You see, Isaac is what we call a type of Christ. He isn't the Christ, but in Abraham's thinking, he represents the Christ. He was the promised seed born by divine power upon a wife who was beyond the age of childbearing. And all the hopes of Abraham and the blessing that promised to the nations is bound up in this individual. The whole event here is a prophecy, not in word, but a prophecy in action. Rather like we could say some of the miracles they are they are preaching in action. So this event is God preaching to Abraham and to all who will hear something of the revelation of his saving purposes. Now, th let's go through the narrative then with this as the key. Abraham understood the need for a sacrifice in order to, in order to approach God. You read through Genesis and everywhere Abraham goes, he builds an altar. He builds an altar because he knows that worship 
involves a sacrifice. There must be an atonement made for sin in order to, for me as a guilty individual, to be received into the presence of a holy God. Abraham understood that full well. But now he is told, you go build an altar and you put the son of promise upon that altar. Do you think Abraham, if not at the time, upon reflection, saw the significance of what God had commanded him? It's been said, this is the only Old Testament type, namely Isaac, that distinctly intimates the need for a human sacrifice to expiate sin, to clear away man's guilt. It's the only type in the Old Testament. We may say, how could God command Abraham to go against his very moral convictions and lay the knife upon his own son? Well, of course, the Lord would not permit it because it would go against God's morality. And yet God needed to convey to Abraham that the only way man's guilt could be truly atoned for would be through the voluntary sacrifice of one who was the spotless human sacrifice, his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we see then depicted here for Abraham and for us? There are four things. I'll go through them just briefly, but hopefully they will furnish us with a vein of meditation which will be of great profit to us. Firstly, we see here a father giving up his only son whom he loves. Isaac is but the type, the shadow, but it foretells something far more profound. Did you know that this is the first time in the whole of the Bible where the word love is used? Not the love of a husband to a wife, not the love of God to human beings, the love of a father to his son. Take thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. Abraham here enters in some degree into the cost to God himself of giving up his son in order to redeem his people. Perhaps we cannot fully appreciate the love of God. We can so easily read those verses in John 3, God so loved the world that he gave. Enter into Abraham's experience here and then we can perhaps say, yes, and in a far more profound way, that's what God has done for me. He's given up his only begotten son whom he loves. How solemn then if we reject the Christ. We're rejecting God who gave his highest and most beloved possession in order to pay the price of sin. When we say in our rebellion, I will not have this savior. I will reject this tender of redemption, then we are in effect rejecting the love of God displayed to us in, ga in giving up his own son. Did you know in the New Testament, the first time love is mentioned in Matthew, it refers to the love of God the Father to his son. Did you know the same time in Mark, it's the love of the father to his son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's the same in Luke. Three times by three separate gospel witnesses in the New Testament, the first declaration and use of love is the father in heaven to the son. But then in John's gospel, which refers to love more than all the other gospels, the first reference to the love 
to love is the love of God in giving that son whom he loved for us. Amazing grace, amazing thought that God should give his son to die for me. Secondly, we see here a glimpse, and Abraham, I believe, saw this, the son of promise in whom all the hopes of every true child of God rests, appointed unto death by God. Abraham saw here that atonement could never be through the blood of a lamb. It would take the blood of the son, the promised son, the seed. He must die. Do you understand that? No animal sacrifice could remove my guilt and yours. Only the precious blood of Christ. You are redeemed, says Peter, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with the precious blood of Christ. Thirdly, we see here a glimpse of death and resurrection. How can it be that Isaac, the appointed son in whom the promises will be secured, is to die? It must be that he rose again or he will rise again. Did you notice when we read Hebrews chapter 11, there's a strange phrase at the end of verse 19 where the apostle says, even accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he, that is Abram, received Isaac in a figure, in a parable. The apostle is saying here that as far as Abraham was concerned, this event was a parable. Abraham had, was prepared to go through with this sacrifice, was he not? God accepted that he was. And so in Abraham's mind, Isaac was already dead. God has willed it. I must perform it. The knife will be thrust in. Isaac is already dead, but he receives him back again. And so when he returns to his young men and then goes to Sarah, he now has a son of promise who was once dead, who is alive again. In parabolic terms, says the writer to the Hebrews. So Abraham here, he understands the son in whom God has given all those promises of salvation. He's died and he's risen again. Do you remember when Christ appeared to his disciples after he's risen from the dead himself? Hebrews, sorry, Luke chapter 24. Remember, he gathers the disciples before he ascends back to his father and he says to them this, these words, these are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, that's Genesis, and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. I don't know if there's any significance in that three days journey. But you see, there were three days in which for Abraham, Isaac was a dead son. He was as good as dead. But on the third day, Abraham receives him back to life. Christ is saying here, look, go read your Old Testament. Go read Genesis and you will see that even there at the very inauguration of Revelation, Christ is being revealed as the suffering saviour who will triumph over death, rise again. But lastly, we must move to conclusion. We read here that the Lord, when he intervened, 
Abraham saw a ram caught in a thicket. In verse 8, in answer to Isaac's question, Abraham had said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. He spoke better than he knew, I believe, at the time. But when he reflected, he thought, yes, what I hoped and believed is now true. God will provide himself. He understands the concept of substitution. Someone must die. Isaac is a sinner. Ultimately, though he's the son of promise, he cannot die. But God will provide for himself a suitable lamb. That would be Christ, the spotless son of the highest. Well, did Abraham actually understand at the time the significance of this prophetic event? Perhaps not in every detail, but he certainly had a good handle upon it because that's what our text is telling us. You may say, Pastor, why did you read verse 14 as a text? Because this is Abraham's testimony to his own experience. What has he learned by this sore trial? Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. Literally, the phrase means the Lord will see to it. Jehovah, the God of the covenant who has revealed his promises to me, he is going to provide. And Moses, who wrote these things, adds, if you like, a, a, an additional comment. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. People understood that Abraham had grasped the significance at least in part of this event. And they were now looking forward. In the mount of the Lord, it will be seen. God will provide. It's thought that Moriah was the mounting upon which, in later years, the temple of Solomon would be built. That temple that, in so many of its details, confirmed and spoke in even richer terms of the coming of the Saviour. In the very mount, it will be seen. All the sacrifices of the temple, all of the furniture, they speak of God providing a way of salvation and acceptance for lost souls to come to God. Do you understand then the significance of these events? Have you traced in your mind from Isaac to the ultimate son of promise, Christ, and said, yes, he is the lamb. He didn't just die in parabolic form. He died in real agony. He died that through him I might have life and forgiveness and peace with God. May the Lord bless us each with a high esteem for our saviour. Amen. We close this morning by singing hymn 577.